Hello, uh, welcome, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Tom Hoke. I am a primary care sports medicine physician at the Maine Dartmouth Sports Medicine Fellowship, um, and also practice family medicine at Augusta Family Medicine and um, sports medicine through the Maine General Sports Medicine and Orthopedics Department here in Augusta, Maine and Waterville, Maine. Um, this is part of the Family Medicine radi Radiology Educational System, and I will be talking today about radiology of the wrist. I have no disclosures regarding this topic. My objectives here are to, uh, number one, learn a systematic approach to reading x-rays of the wrist to review three common adult findings that we typically see on x-ray within our family medicine and sports medicine clinics, and then discuss the clinical correlation of these x-ray findings. So starting off, it's important that you're ordering the right films. So the common three views of the wrist are a PA or posterior anterior, a lateral, and an oblique. Make sure that those are the films you're typically getting. Some organizations' protocols only start with a two view of the wrist, and as I'll show you later, they can miss subtle findings when without uh, multiple views. And then we'll talk about some additional views that you might want to get in the right clinical scenario, including the scaphoid or the navicular view, the clenched fist view, as well as the carpal tunnel view. So starting off with the PA of the wrist, first thing you want to do is make sure that there is no rotation. Uh, so that it's a true PA. And for, for this one, looking at the relationship of the radius and the ulna, tracing those cortices and making sure that there's no overlap between the radius and the ulna. Looking at the radial inclination, and I have a slide showing you that later, but it's the normal tilt of that radius where you can see that distal radius articular surface is tilted towards the ulna side of the wrist. Checking for ulnar variance, which is the relationship of the distal radius to the distal ulna. In this view, they are uh, equal in length, but in some scenarios, you may have one bone that's slightly longer than the other, and that can predispose to certain clinical issues. Then turning your attention to the carpal bones, you should see two to three millimeters of uh, um, open space between each carpal bone, looking for sclerosis and any breakdown there. And then I would like to bring your attention to the relationship of the lunate to the distal radius and the ulna. Typically, two thirds of the lunate articular surface is with the radius, and about a third is with the ulna. So, looking into the PA of the wrist a little bit more, this is a um, depiction showing the typical radial inclination of, of the distal radius, and it should be about 21 to 25 degrees of radial inclination. And that's the um, the peak of the radial styloid or the most distal part of the radial styloid to the um, distal radial ulnar joint. Here are some radiographs showing uh, ulnar variants, and you can either have positive ulnar variants as shown in the radiograph on the bottom or negative ulnar variants as shown on the top where the ulna is actually shorter. Uh, versus when the ulna is longer. And obviously, if the ulna is longer, you can get compression within the ulnar joint, within the, the um, TFCC joint and other ulnar um, components of the wrist. And with ulnar negativity, uh, you can get asymmetric stresses through the lunate bone. One more thing to look at on PA of the wrist are the three carpal lines or the three arcs of Jalula. The first one is... Um, the most proximal row. So you've got the scaphoid and the lunate, as well as the triquetrium. And then distally, you should see a concavity of these same three bones. If you have any disruption of those, you think about dislocations, fractures, anatomic variations, things like that. And then lastly, the third or most distal arc is the uh, capitate and the hamate. Moving on to the lateral, the typical lateral of the wrist, you should have no rotation, uh, which in this case would mean that the ulna and the radius are completely overlapping. There should be a linear relationship of the distal radius to the lunate to the capitate shown here by this bright white line. If not, you can need to consider either a distal radius fracture or a lunate or perilunate dislocation. 
lunate dislocation being a dislocation of the lunate from the distal radius, perilunate being the capitate from the lunate more distally. Trace the cortex of the ulna and the radius, again, looking for any subtle fractured irregularities. On the lateral view, you can also um, assess the normal palmar or volar tilt of the distal radius. This should be anywhere from 10 to 25 degrees. If you have uh, less of a volar tilt here, you might think about a distal radius fracture with some dorsal angulation uh, or vice versa if you have an increased uh, palmar or volar tilt. And the last of the typical three view is an oblique. This is just an additional view um, of the radial ulnar and carpal cortices so you can pick out subtle irregularities that might not show up on your initial two view. Here's one more three view of the wrist. I would like to bring to your attention that these are a little bit overexposed. Um, and additionally, that lateral is not a true lateral because you don't have uh, complete overlap of that radius in the ulna. So the more specific views that you might get in the right clinical scenario. So within your family medicine clinic, sports medicine clinic, we see this all the time. Somebody falls on an outstretched hand, they've got pain at the base of the thumb within that scaphoid, snuff box tenderness. Um, and so you're worried about a scaphoid fracture. So this is a view that brings the entire scaphoid cortex into, into view uh, without any overlap and allows you to better, better visualize that cortex. So it's done with the wrist and radial ulnar, ulnar, rain, sorry, and ulnar deviation, which elongates that scaphoid. And keeping in mind that uh, scaphoid pain plus the correct mechanism is a, a cold scaphoid fracture until proven otherwise, even if your initial set of x-rays are normal. Um, so in that clinical scenario, you either immobilize them and re-x-ray them in seven to 10 days or potentially order advanced imaging uh, if there's some urgency to the situation. The clinched fist view is, is a useful um, view for somebody that has chronic uh, wrist pain with grasping and, and things like that. Um, it's a view that we use to look for scaphoid dissociation, which is a disruption or a tearing of the scaphoid ligament. And when you put a stress through that scaphoid ligament uh, by clenching your fist, it can uh, show some widening uh, of the normal space between the scaphoid and the lunate. And so anything greater than four millimeters between the scaphoid and lunate on a clenched fist view or a PA view, you'd be concerned about a scaphoid lunate dissociation. Lastly, there's the carpal tunnel view. This is a view looking through the palm of the hand with the wrist and, and fingers and extension. And it nicely shows you the floor of the carpal tunnel. And then on the ulnar side, you get a good view of the hook and the handmaid as well as the piezer form. And then on the radial side, you get the, the, the radial border of the carpal tunnel, which is the trapezium. These can be especially helpful for looking for hook of the handmaid fractures shown here. Hook of the handmaid and pisiform fractures can be important um, clinically because uh, injury there can compress the ulnar nerve within Guillaume's canal and cause distal ulnar nerve symptoms as well. So next I wanna talk about three common adult conditions of the wrist. And the first is the distal radius fracture. So here is a transverse fracture uh, through the distal radius. You see that lucency um, both on the oblique as well as on the PA. And then on the lateral, you actually see some loss of that typical palmar, palmar um, angulation with a, a, a sharp angle here at the distal radius consistent with a distal radius fracture. Here's a more subtle distal radius fracture. All you see is a little bit of disruption at the distal radius. Zooming in, you can see that a little more clearly. And here's um, some views that show the importance of multiple views. So this is a patient of a colleague of mine. Here's a PA of the wrist. Here's a lateral of the wrist. Both of those look fairly normal. And here's the oblique showing a, uh, a large, somewhat displaced intraarticular fracture of the distal radius. This ended up needing to see one of our hand surgery colleagues. Here's a less subtle fracture. Um, this is a distal radius fracture in an elderly person with shortening dorsal angulation that ended up needing a two-part stabilization surgery.
scaphoid fractures. I think this is a great view um, showing some lucency throughout the waist of the scaphoid there on a PA and then an avicular or a scaphoid view. Please excuse the pediatric films here with the open physes. Here's a more subtle scaphoid fracture that presented in our clinic. This was the initial set of x-rays that were done within an express care. And they did a PA and an oblique. There was no dedicated scaphoid view. Not sure if it would have shown up anyways, but these x-rays look pretty normal. Two weeks later, you can see a, um, a very clear lucency within the waist of the scaphoid. And then a four month follow-up, you see improvement with immobilization. Kimebox disease is the last clinical um, scenario I want to discuss. You'll see it less frequently, but, but keep your eyes peeled for it. It's avascular necrosis of the lunate. Risk factors here are trauma, and this can be acute trauma or repetitive trauma. Um, one risk factor is ulnar negativity, and that's because the asymm asymmetric um, stress through the lunate, when the ulna is short, all of the stress goes through the radiolunate joint. Uh, and that can predispose to avascular necrosis. And there can be some anatomic variations in blood flow as well. So the common radiologic findings here are sclerosis of the lunate, seen on this last view, flattening of the lunate, seen on this view, and then keep your eyes out for that ulnar negativity. X-rays may be normal initially, and you may need MRI to show some edema in, in early in the, in the uh, course of illness. So in summary, Please order multiple views, typically at least three. Look at your own films and correlate them to the exam. This is the one um, advantage you have over the radiologist is that you know how the patient presents, where they're tender, what their history it is, what their history is. Please scan methodically and completely, and then be wary for uh, non-displaced or occult fractures with the right mechanism of an exam and hang on to these patients and repeat imaging or um, proceed to advanced imaging as needed. So thank you so much, and um, I appreciate your interest.